What's going on everybody and welcome to another video. So today's video is gonna be a little bit different than my normal ones. Today I want to address all of the most common questions that I get uh, from my YouTube channel. And I get a ton of questions either, whether if it's in the comments, uh, sometimes people find me on Facebook and they Facebook message me. I've even had some people do some really good detective work and uh, they found my personal email and they would just email me questions and stuff like that, which I don't know how they, they found me, but they found me. Um, so wh what I wanna do is compile all the most commonly uh, asked questions that I get all the time and just compile them all into one quick video. Uh, I have a note here of the top 10 most requested, uh, well not requested, but the most common questions that I'm always getting over and over and over. So hopefully this one video, all the people that do follow this channel will be like, oh, okay, now I get it, now it's answered. And they won't have to dig through all these different videos and, and figure things out, okay? So let's get started. Uh, now before I, I uh, to go through these uh, questions, if you happen to know one of these questions might have been yours or a question like it, please don't be offended. There's no such thing as a dumb question. It's, you know, everybody starts somewhere. Uh, we all have to learn. So let's just get through these. Uh, one, of the, one of these questions. So it goes, I got some perfume oils and when I mix it with alcohol, it doesn't smell or, perfume, or perform like a real perfume. Can you help me? Um, the answer, the quick answer is, no, I cannot help you. And the main reason for that is because you're not using the right materials to make a spray alcoholic perfume. If you're purchasing things called fragrance oils or perfume oils, uh, that should be a dead giveaway that, well, one, it's, it's an oil. It's an oil-based substance. Usually these are fragrances that are heavily diluted in oil carrier oils, like uh, jojoba oil, fractionated coconut oil, uh, almond oil. So you can't really use things in perfumery in a sense of like a, a spray-on alcohol type fragrance. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. These materials are not meant to be used in perfumery in the sense of spray alcohol applications. You can, however, use these in other applications if you're trying to make fragrances for like uh, candles, soaps, uh, reed diffusers, like oil, reed, uh, the little uh, oil diffusers and so, or even Glade plug-in, like uh, those, uh, uh, the things you plug into the, the outlets of your walls that holds oils and it burns off oils for scent. You can use perfume oils and things for that, but you cannot use them for perfumery in a sense of alcoholic spray applications. They, it just won't work. Uh, the reason why people are always like, I'm trying it and it's just, you know, it doesn't smell or perform like a real perfume. That's because it's an oil-based product. It's gonna sit too close to your skin and it's gonna be so damp and so oily and so moist, it's never gonna project because it's just sitting on your skin. There's no alcohol to evaporate it all away. Uh, and obviously it's not gonna smell like a real perfume because usually these people that buy fragrance oils, they're usually knockoffs of like, they'll buy, they'll buy like a Versace per ohm fragrance oil and they think if they just add alcohol to it, they can make their own Versace per ohm, you know, fragrance for a fraction of the cost. It just doesn't work that way. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, second question, I get this one quite a bit. Are there any single materials that I can purchase to increase longevity, projection, and sillage? I just need one material. The quick answer again, no. <laughs> there is not a single material that will do that. Um, if you want to increase longevity, projection, sillage, it's the whole perfume composition has to be considered as a whole. There's not one single ingredient that you're gonna add in that's just all of a sudden gonna make it turn into a beast. Uh, the choice materials that you choose, in, you know, in, alongside with all the other materials combined is what's going to determine your projection, sillage, you know, diffusion and things like that. Now, there are some other sides to this. There are single materials that you can buy like 
I believe it's called like Glu uh, Glucam uh, P20 or P40, which is an oil-based substance. And you can put a few drops of that in your, you know, finished perfume, uh, usually at like maybe one or 2% max in the complete perfume. But again, it's an oily based substance. So the claim to these materials are, it will increase the longevity of top notes. Well, yes, it does do that because it's an oil based product and it just adheres the, you know, the fleeting top notes close, you know, close to the skin so they don't uh, evaporate as rapidly. Uh, the downside to it though, is because it is an oily type substance, it will dampen your fragrance down. So while yes, it will make your top notes last longer, uh, in the overall scheme of things, you're going to lose on some projection. Um, so you'll, you'll gain some longevity performance, but you're now losing some projection and sillage and things like that. So for the person that's asking or the people that are asking, what are some single materials that I can purchase that will increase just pretty much all aspects that people want in a perfume? Better longevity, better sillage, better projection, beast mode. There isn't, it's, it's, it doesn't happen. It has to be well thought out choice materials in concession with everything else, all the other materials combined uh, that completes this you know, perfume to react that way. So if you want better projection, you know, all these different materials that you're choosing in you know, your base, middle or top notes, choose better projecting materials. There's, there's some that sit close to the skin and then there's some that are actually very diffusive. You just have to know which ones to get. And there's hundreds and hundreds of them out there. So for me to say, you know, which ones are they? You just have to, you know, buy as many materials as you can and experiment and just try them all. So that, that's how I want to answer that question. That's a tough one to answer, quite honestly. Uh, number three, this is an easy one. Somebody asks, how many materials do you own or have? Uh, as of today, I think we're in uh, like uh, we're February 16th. I think today's day, I don't even know what day it is. It's mid-February. Last time I checked, I think I have just a little over like maybe 400 or 420 different materials, which isn't a lot. To somebody just now subscribing to the channel or just now getting into perfumery, they're probably like, oh my God, that's so many. How do you, you know, why do you need so many? Trust me, you're gonna want that many. As far as I'm concerned, I don't even have half the amount of materials that I want to have. Um, but perfumery is expensive, and if you're buying your own materials yourself, and you know, you have to, you know, start somewhere and grow your material library slowly. So right now I'm at about 400 materials. I store everything down in drawers. And shelves and whatever I'm working on today I have them out right here out and about but when I'm done I just store everything away in, in shelves and drawers so yeah how many materials I have right now a little over 400 right now question four this one I get asked a lot and it's so difficult to answer and I hope people don't get hurt by my answer but can you show us how to make an all natural perfume using only real natural ingredients. No, I cannot. Well, not to say that I cannot, I can, but I will not. And the reason for that is while I do get the environmentally friendly conscious consumers and people out there that want to make perfumes using nothing but all natural ingredients, there's downsides to that. Uh, generally, all natural ingredients don't project as much as a synthetic you know, counterpart. They don't last as long or have the longe uh, longevity of a synthetic counterpart. Um, so while I could sit there and do a video and be like, hey, here's an all natural perfume that you can do at home. I'm using you know, real labdanum, real benzoin, real rose, real you know, grapefruit oil, real this. At the end of the day, in my opinion, it's gonna suck. It's not gonna smell anything like a good perfume that you would go to like Bloomingdale's or Macy's or department store and purchase off the shelf. And you're gonna smell it and be like, this smells like hippie juice. That's what I call it, hippie juice. Uh, Cause that's what it smells like. It's just raw materials. And usually they don't end up smelling that pleasant because using all raw natural materials generally 
don't have a pleasant smell to begin with. Like if you were to smell an all natural rose absolute, a lot of them smell very dirty. And while they do smell like roses, but it's all natural. So you're getting the grit, the dirt, the grime, the oiliness along with it. And that goes with any natural material. You're getting the raw stuff. And a lot of times people will smell the raw material and be like, uh, this is the real thing. Why doesn't it smell as good as I thought it would? And that's because it's, it's real. I mean, you gotta take the good with the bad. So to answer that question, can you show us how to make an all natural perfume using all real natural ingredients? I can, but I'm not going to because that's not really what I'm into. Like I like to make fragrances that smell of you know finished professional quality like you would smell in a department store off the shelf uh, all those perfumes that you you know store bought in a department store generally are probably 80 to 90 percent synthetic anyways you may get lucky and find a good perfume that has little bits of natural ingredients in it but they're usually backed up with a lot of synthetic counterparts to help do the heavy heavy lifting um, so yeah, so hopefully that didn't hurt too many people's feelings when I answered that that way. Uh, number five is actually tied into that same question. How can I increase the longevity and projection of my all natural perfume using only essential oils? And quite frankly, it's, I think I've already explained it in question four. You just really can't. Um, if somebody were to take an all natural uh, we'll just say an all-natural bergamot oil versus a synthetic, you know, chemically made bergamot rendition and you smell the two side by side, they're going to smell pretty similar and nine times out of ten, the, the chemically made one is always going to be just a little bit more projecting, a little bit zestier, a little bit brighter and definitely usually is going to last a lot longer. Um, so you, you can't really increase the longevity and projection uh, projection of anything just using just you know essential oils or natural ingredients when i build my perfume or any of my perfumes like i actually combine the, the both natural and synthetics like i have natural sweet orange oil here i've got uh, coriander coriander seed essential oil here but i also have some fake you know yuzu uh, synthetic yuzu here. I've got real violet leaf absolute here. Uh, where are we at? Cedar wood, essential oil, you know, but then you have to back it with things like, you know, Isoe Super, Hedion, some, you know, some chemically made, you know, woods and some other things like aldehydes and, you know, Cis Six uh, Nanio, which is like a watermelon chemical. Uh, yeah, chemi watermelon chemical. So when you combine all these things, they all kind of interact with each other. So yes, you get the best of both worlds, in my opinion, when you combine natural with synthetics. You get the realism and the naturalness of the, you know, absolutes and the essential oils, but then you also support that and back that up with some synthetic renditions or synthetic molecules that will help give it some of that projection lift and longevity that you're looking for or maybe it imparts a different scent or a twist to that naturalness that you're looking for maybe your natural material isn't as bright and zesty as you want it so you would find a synthetic rendition of that and combine the two so you get the best of both worlds so i didn't really answer that question uh <laughs> directly but uh, we're gonna skip and go to the the next one number six what kind of weight scale do you recommend? Um, when you're first starting off into perfumery, you're gonna wanna get a scale. Don't use drops and think your formulas are ever gonna be accurate. You're never gonna be able to scale up a formula into larger batches based on drops. If you're gonna, unless you're gonna sit there and count, I need 300 drops of this material, 500, you know, it's just, you gotta use a scale. So what I, usually use like there's this trusted like this model is rebranded many different ways like this one's made by us solid that i purchased i got it for a hundred dollars online you can find uh replicate uh repl you know replica uh scales that look just like this with the same guts same counterparts but it's just branded something else and you can probably find those for 65 70 dollars what you're going to want to look for in a good scale is 
you know, a couple different factors. You're going to want to look at what's the weight capacity. How much weight can can it hold total? And that really, you have you have to ask yourself, well, how much, you know, perfume am I making? Am I making just small little, you know, one bottle at a time, or am I making, you know, large canisters? So, if you're doing just one bottle at a time, you're just tinkering, you're playing with things. Stick with a scale that goes up to maybe 200 grams max weight capacity. If you are doing a much larger scale and you're making jugs and massive, you know, mass producing stuff, you're definitely going to need a much larger scale that doubles, triples that, you know, that weight amount. Um, another factor you're going to want to look at is readability. And that is how, you know, how many uh, uh, decimal points will it read out on the scale? Mine that I have will go uh, down to 0 0.000. So that's three decimal, you know, three decimal places of a gram. Uh, you can get by with just a 0 0.00, but I like that extra decimal because I, I tend to find that some scales aren't as accurate and they can drift uh, a little bit. So when you have that extra decimal place, it just gives you a better idea of where you're at as far as the weights. Another thing that you will want to consider is accuracy. <clears throat> so there's readability, which is how many decimal points will it read as far as weight in grams. But accuracy is important too, because if it's not an accurate scale, then what's the point of having, having it read that low as far as weight? Uh, you'll want to find a, a scale that can be <coughs> as accurate as plus or minus 0.003 grams. That means it can shift anywhere from 0.003 grams at any given time, which in my opinion, that's acceptable. Uh, to give you an example, if I were to take one drop of this passion fruit and drop it in, it might weigh out as... 0 0.01 or 0 0.015 grams for one drop. If I were to then take another drop and put one drop in, it might read out as 0 0.017 grams. So it, it'll shift and vary plus or minus by 0 0.003, which that's acceptable in my opinion. So hopefully that kind of answers that. But <coughs> generally, you're going to want to spend a minimum of $60 and up for an acceptable scale. If you're not spending $60, $65 and up, it's probably not an adequate scale. Okay, let me just get a sip of water real quick before we crank through the remaining questions. <clears throat> so here's another odd question that I get from people that watch my videos when I do formulation videos and I kind of formulate and I, and I tell you my formula as I'm going along in, you know, how many parts per thousand and stuff like that. A lot of people ask, how many drops of materials is in your formula for this video? And again, for somebody that's asking for how many drops, it doesn't matter. Like, because you, you, when you're given a formula based on parts per thousand, like say if I add in one drop of Calone and it's one part per thousand, it doesn't matter how many drops it takes or how much weight it is. That's a, per, uh, that's a percent of a formula, which is 0.1% is Calone or one part per thousand. So when somebody asks how many drops, don't think of it in terms of drops or weight. A formula is a formula. You can break it down as a percentage or parts per thousand, but it's don't think of it as drops. And again, to go back to the scale question, get a scale, stop using drops. <laughs> Okay, here's another good question. And this is probably a question that a lot of people get confused about because they're mixing different, uh, well, let me just get to it. This question says, I have 20 grams of perfume concentrate. So this person went through the, the trouble of actually making a, a, a perfume concentrate. Now he's gonna make a, an actual perfume and he wants to dilute it in alcohol probably wanting to make like an EDT or an EP or something like that. So he's like, I have 20 grams of perfume concentrate. How many ml milliliters of alcohol do I need to make, do I need to add to make it an EDP concentration of 20% for a 100 ml bottle? <coughs> now, 
The problem with this question is, is these people are confusing two different uh, um, scales. They're, they're confusing weight with volume. Weight obviously is grams. He has 20 grams of perfume concentrate, that's weight. But he wants to know how many ml in milliliters, that's volume, of alcohol do I make, you know, a 20% concentration into a 100 ml bottle, again, volume. He's trying to figure out weight and volume, and he kind of thinks they're one and the same. He, a lot of people confuse this as far as, you know, they think, well, one gram of something in weight is probably one ml in volume, and that is not true. <clears throat> um, I can sit here and take five grams of something and then weigh it out as five grams, and then dump it into a beaker, and it's not gonna be five, L, five ml exactly. It may be close, it may look close, but depending on the weight of the material can, can change that. Especially if you're using something heavy, like cedarwood essential oil is a very thick, dense, weighted material. So five grams of cedarwood essential oil in weight may not look like five ml in terms of volume. It might only look like 4.5. Or if you take something very light and watery, uh, like um, <clears throat> bergamot oil, you know, that's so light and watery, that one might actually come out equal, you know, five grams to five ml, but it's never the case. The point of this that I'm trying to, to get across is, don't mix up weight and volume and think they're one and the same. So to answer this guy's question, is if he has 20 grams of perfume and he wants to make it an EDP 20% concentration, well, you add 80 grams weight of alcohol will give you now a 20% uh, final finished mixture. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to fit a 100 ml bottle. <clears throat> it may be more, it may be less. And that's the problem with uh, some people uh, making you know one bottle at a time they're always trying to figure out how much do i need to make so i fit exactly this bottle i don't want any more i don't want any less and you'll never you'll never it'll never happen so i always do uh when i do you know one bottle at a time i always overcompensate and i always try to make more than i think i need and and that's okay because you can always fill up your 100 ml bottle to the top and be like, there you go, there's a 100 ml bottle and whatever's left over, you know, I always have like these little spray bottles. I've got hundreds and hundreds of these things all, you know, laying around and just fill those up. Give them away as like little testers, you know, give them to your friends and family or if you're selling perfume, why not give away free samples and vials of, you know, your other finished products. So always overcompensate and make more than what you need and whatever is done when you're done filling the bottle, just fill, fill up little sprayers and keep them around as giveaways. <clears throat> uh, two, two questions left. Do you test your finished fragrances on paper strips or skin? And this is a great question. Um, the best answer to this question would be, you test your fragrance uh, based on what the end application was intended to be. And that, for me, <clears throat> like if I'm making a spray alcoholic perfume, and I test, you know, I make a trial batch, I keep going, and I'm testing it, I, you know, I'm trying to figure out if it smells good or not. I test it on my skin. I spray it on like as if, as if it was a finished product. <clears throat> Obviously it's diluted you know, to EDT or EDP before I do that because I want it to simulate what a finished product is going to smell like. Um, I'll spray it on my clothes to see how it wears on clothes. I'll spray it on other people because skin chemistry is different on everyone. So, but if you're making a, let's say a perfume for the intended root, uh, use as like a roll-on perfume, you would then test it, obviously, you would have like little, you know, tester roll-ons, you would fill it up and test it that way because how it performs as a roll-on versus a spray application are two completely different um, 
interpretations of a perfume. Like I can take one of these <clears throat> finished perfumes and spray it on. I, I think it smells great, but if I fill up a roll-on bottle, roll it on, it's gonna smell different. Certain notes aren't gonna be as evaporative because a roll-on is, you know, adhered to your skin. Uh, usually roll-ons will have um, a little bit less alcohol and more oils in it so it adheres to the skin. So it's gonna be a little bit different. So the best way to answer that question is, you know, do you test your finished fragrances on paper strips or skin is test it as your intended final use of your products. Uh, if you're making candles, if you're making soaps, don't make a fragrance and then spray it into the air and see how it smells. You know, make it into a, a, a small piece of test soap or a small piece of a test candle. That's the only true way you're gonna know how it smells based on, you gotta smell it as you intended it, the use for it, basically. <clears throat> um, let's see. <clears throat> the last question, question 10. I get this a lot, basically, uh, a month ago, I had a video on should I or should I not pre-dilute my material? So I now get this question quite a bit. And this question is <clears throat> not a question of should I, it's how do I figure out how much I need to pre-dilute a certain material? And there's two parts to this answer really. One part is, is you gotta learn you really should, and the only way to learn is by using the material. Obviously, if you use something neat in a blend and if it's overpowering and too strong just by a single drop, you know how you, you, you know you're gonna have to pre-dilute it to tame that odor strength. Uh, so the question usually is, well, how much do I dilute it by? And there's two things that I usually do to determine how I like to pre-dilute my materials. One, <clears throat> I'll scour the internet um, and research this new material that I have not used before. So if I want to pre-dilute a new material, <clears throat> uh, I would, you know, research the material online and see if there's usually like there's a website, thegoodsensecompany.com. They usually have a recommended dosing uh, or recommended uh, smelling dilution. That's a good starting point. Uh, another thing that you would want to do is research demo formulas like big fragrance houses like Furminich, IFF, Simrise and things like that they publish uh, public you know finished fragrance and formulas with all these different materials that you know they have or from other houses and usually you can just google like let's say let's see I've got here uh, Jasmatone uh, I have it pre-diluted down to five percent and that's what I like to use it at. And you're probably thinking, well, how did I get to that? <clears throat> One, I had to mess with it for a little bit and figure this out because I initially had it diluted at 10% and I found that I added it in a trial blend and even a single drop at 10% was just too strong. It was too noticeable. So I dropped, I cut it in half and 5% seems to work well. But what I also did was I scoured the internet and you can Google Jasmatone demo formula and usually you'll always come up with some sort of demo formulas usually goodsensecompany.com has tons and hundreds of demo formulas fragrance houses jivadan iff simrise have public demo formulas and you'll run across these materials and it'll show you what the you know what the formula is what the material is so if you come across material you're not sure what to dilute it at look at demo formulas and see how they are using it in a formula so in the case of let's say like the new material cast calone or even the old one calone a lot of people don't know how to dilute it one goodsensecompany.com says we recommend diluting this to i think they recommend 10 percent i find that way too strong you look at other demo formulas out there and most people are using it at one part per thousand, maybe two parts per thousand max. So then as you're building your perfume, usually you have a formula and you're calculating things as you go. You have to figure out, well, if I add in a single drop of Calone, what dilution ratio will it have to be to, for one drop to equal one or two parts per thousand? And that's where the math part comes in. And you'll just have to figure, I mean, you know, people hate math, but you know what? 
If you're in perfumery, you, if you don't embrace it, then you're just doomed to fail. You need to know math. You don't have to be great at it, but once you get into the swing of things, fractions, percents, decimals, it all will become natural to you. But research demo formulas, see what other perfumers are using that material in a formula at what percent per thousand. And then you ask yourself, well, if I add in one or two drops of this material, those one or two one or two drops at what percent ratio would it have to be pre-diluted to equal that you know average use amount that I'm seeing in all these demo formulas and that's probably the best starting point you start there and then obviously you tweak it uh, to your own likings because you know sometimes what publication formulas show online may not necessarily be what you want the material to do for you uh, another good thing, <clears throat> one of my older, older videos, probably from uh, six, seven months ago, I have a, a formula spreadsheet, like a calculator. And this thing's super useful. If you haven't used it or downloaded it, go back, find the video, download it and use it because it does all the calculations for you. <clears throat> you just basically have to put in your weight in grams of the single material what the pre-dilution is, uh, whether if you have it pre-diluted 10%, if you're using 100% neat, full strength, 50%, 20, it doesn't matter. You put in the weight in grams you're dropping in, what the pre-dilution level is from zero to one, or from one to 1% 1 to 100, and it'll tell you what that parts per thousand is in the formula. So that's an easy way to indicate, you know, how much you would need to cut a material or pre-dilute a material to equal how many parts per thousand is the average use, basically. So that was the top 10 questions that I most commonly get. Um, this video went a hell of a lot longer than I thought it would be because, I, again, I rambled on. I apologize. I'm always rambling. Um, so, yeah. So with that being said, <clears throat> until next time.